Today, I'm going to start off with a couple of passages of Scripture. If you uh, want, there are some pew Bibles. If you want to look it up on your phone or your iPad or whatever you've got, feel free to do that as well. The key verse for today is going to be uh, Mark 16, 15. I will also be referencing back a couple of times to the verse I used last week. Uh, if you were here last week, that was John 14, 6, and then I'm going to kind of tag on as a bonus uh, John 14, 21, because it goes along with that bigger idea really well. So Mark 16, 15 is going to be the big idea, the key verse, if you're going to follow along today. Um, Jesus says this. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life, right? And no one comes to the Father except for through me. We got that last week. That was the John 14, 16. And then the key one, Mark 16, 15, this week, Jesus says this to us. Hear these words, the words of Jesus. He says, go into the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole of creation, right? So in other words, if we want to simplify that, Jesus says, preach the good news to everyone, everywhere, right? Preach the good news to everyone, everywhere. So keep those verses in mind today as I'm speaking and preaching here. Uh, Keep those verses just kind of in the back of your mind because they play such an important role in what it is we're talking about. Now, now my question for you to get things started off today is, have you ever, kind of like me, felt perhaps a little bit hesitant to share the gospel because you thought that the other person simply might not be interested in hearing about it. You ever felt that way before? You ever ever just said, man, I don't know if I want to tell people about Jesus because I don't know if they're going to be interested, right? You ever found yourself in those shoes? I have. I've had that concern before, right? Have you ever sensed the Lord perhaps leading you to witness to somebody You heard that little voice, though, in the back of your head that said, you know, I don't know if we should say something today because you might end up starting an argument here, right? You ever, you ever, you you know, those old cartoons where you got the angel and the devil, right? Well, angel's saying, tell them about Jesus. Well, devil's going, you're going to start an argument, right? Am I the only one that's ever seen those cartoons? (laughs) Right? Or have you ever been maybe just slow to share your faith? Because you didn't feel like you were gifted from God and the Holy Spirit with the gift of evangelism, right? How many of you are evangelists? I shouldn't have my hand up. We got got one, one hand up, right? I am not a gifted evangelist. I will tell you that quite honestly. Of the lists of giftings that God has given me, doesn't matter if I just believe it myself. The tests that I've taken, you, know, you can go to seminary, they, they prod you like they do at a hospital. Instead of using needles, they use theology, but they, they test you for a lot of things. And, and one of the things I was not overly high in is evangelism. I'm not a natural in the sense of evangelist. I have friends who are evangelists. I have a, one of my good seminary class, good friends, seminary classmates, uh, it is a Billy Graham accredited evangelist fellow. He's got special classification. In fact, he is literally on his way back from Africa from a, a tour that he did in Central Africa. My friend, his name is Sammy. He's Kenyan. And, and Sammy uh, has recently been in Kenya with a team of people out of the Twin Cities primarily spreading the gospel. They go to soccer stadiums and thousands of people come and hundreds of people give their life to Christ every night. And, and Sammy is just tremendous as an evangelist. And I know I'm not Sammy. So if you, like me, have ever felt like, oh, I don't know if I really want to share my faith. I'm not an evangelist, right? Maybe I should leave that to somebody with that gift, right? You know, I don't, I don't overhaul my own engines in my driveway. I leave that to the mechanic. So maybe... I should leave this evangelism thing to the evangelists, right? These are emotions that I think every Christian has felt at one time or another. You know, I I literally, I've certainly struggled. I've struggled with fear of sharing my faith, wondering if I was going to say the wrong thing, wondering if I was going to start an argument, wondering if somebody else might be better at sharing faith with them instead of me. Even even me, my, my wife, my wife is 
much, much more of an evangelist than I am. And it would be easy for me to go, well, you go tell them about Jesus. You're better at this than me, right? So I, I could be lazy and easy and just let say, you go. We've all kind of been there, I think. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've, you've encountered these feelings. But what I've found during my years of sharing Christ and, and frankly, training others to do so, uh, what I've found is, as I study the Bible, while we are not all gifted evangelists, what I have found as I studied the Bible is there is nowhere in the Bible that says just because you're not an evangelist, you don't get to share the faith. Do you know that? We are all called to share our faith. We are not all gifted in evangelism, but we are all called to share our faith. And there's no biblical rationale that we can come up with. Believe me, I've read the whole book more than once, and I haven't found it. And if it's in there, you can show it to me later, but I don't think you're going to be able to. The Bible doesn't say, because we're not gifted as evangelists, we get to not do this. So, we better talk about this a little bit then, right? We better equip ourselves a little bit, right? If I don't know how to do something, in this day and age, what I find myself doing an awful lot, I go to YouTube, right? So if I need to overhaul the engine of my lawnmower, I can go onto YouTube, pull up a video, and just sit down and every, every couple of minutes stop it, take those bolts out, and just follow a video tutorial. There, there's a video tutorial on YouTube for just about everything. Well, today is going to be not quite a video tutorial, but today is going to be us talking about sharing our faith, okay? And, and, and we're going to keep talking about this. I told you this when, be, actually before you hired me, I told you this when I was interviewing and candidating here. We're going to talk about this because we need to talk about this because, frankly, most all of us are uncomfortable with the idea of sharing our faith. And in fact, from my studies in, in God's Word, I've found kind of five key concepts that I'm going to share with you today that have been made clear to me about witnessing. Concepts that impact the lives of every one of us. And I don't care if you're a kid in school or you're already at the nursing home. These apply to all of us. And first and probably most important of those principles is that Christ has given us, each of us, as Christ followers, a very clear command. Jesus Christ's last command to his followers was this. Mark sixteen fifteen, You are to go into the world and preach the good news to everyone, everywhere. Period. This command, which the church calls the Great Commission, right? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations is, is, a, is another one of the Gospels, the way it says it. This command, the Great Commission, wasn't intended just for his 11 disciples, right? And it wasn't intended just for the apostles, right? And it wasn't even intended just for the early church. It wasn't even intended just for those who have the gift of evangelism. It's a command to all of us. We as Christians have the duty, and if I might even go so far as to say, the privilege Every man, woman, and child who calls on Christ as Lord has the privilege to share this. We don't get to pick and choose which of the commands of the Lord we choose to follow, right? When God speaks to us through the Bible as Christians, we don't, we don't get to go, well, I like that one and I don't like this one, so I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do that, Jesus, right? We don't get to do that. We don't get to selectively choose. We don't get to pick which commands that Jesus gave us that we're going to follow. We have to submit in obedience and live out what God is calling us to. And among those things included in that is our sharing of our faith as we go about our lives. We're all called to it. Another key idea about evangelism and why we need to do this, and this comes straight from Scripture, is that men and women are lost 
Men and women are lost without Jesus Christ. This goes back to our key verse from last week, right? Jesus wasn't kidding when he said these words. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except for through me. And then if we continue reading on the Word of God, in Acts 4.12, we see this. It says, and there is salvation in no one else. Nobody else. For there is no other name under heaven given by men which we might be saved by. Now there was a guy, I knew this guy a number of years ago. Um, he and I were never really close friends, but I'd known him for quite a number of years. And, and I'd heard through the grapevine in, in our mid-20s that he had had cancer. And, and he ended up having a, a pretty rough go of cancer. He was young, he was single, he had cancer, and he just struggled with it. Now, I knew him from our childhood, a lot of mutual friends, and I knew that he had kind of a nominal Christian background. He, he had come to our youth group a couple of times, and he had, you know, they, he and his family went to a different church, but they were kind of the, the C&E kind of folk, right? Christmas and Easter, right? They'd show up at the major holidays and they would be at the church if there was a funeral of a family member and a few other functions of that nature, but they just were not committed. And, and his parents weren't particularly committed and therefore as he grew, he was even less committed than his parents about the church. And as he went through this post-cancer recovery, um, he had begun to, to date a young lady, and this young lady was, was, was deeply into uh, yoga and Hinduism and New Age spirituality. Now, he and I hadn't spoken for years, but all of a sudden one day on Facebook, I get this message from him. And me being a pastor, I would like to say this never happens, but this happens more than you would actually believe. I get random messages from people in my distant background of life Sometimes for good and sometimes for bad because they see that I'm a pastor, right? And so he types this up, shoots it off to me. And, and if you know, if you follow me on Facebook, many of you do, I'm pretty open and public about my faith, right? I post frequently scripture and all kinds of stuff and, and things that are going on in the church. So, so it was apparent to him, I'm sure. I post my sermons and that kind of stuff that he could talk to me about faith. So he sends me this message just out of the blue, with a, a little bit of a short summary of the last few years of his life, and then a lengthy rant about how narrow-minded, about how bigoted, about how hateful I am as a pastor and as a Christian. Because I believe in the Bible, and because I do believe that if you don't follow Jesus and trust in him, that you're destined to hell. Period. I'm not afraid to say that. And he was angry at God. And he was angry at me because I am now the representative of that God. And so he lashed out. He, he, he wrote this lengthy complaint to me. And it was interesting as he was railing against this God in places as I would read it, he would say he really doesn't really believe in that God, but he's angry at that God nonetheless, which cognitively has some dissonance there. And, and you could just, as I would read it, you could just feel his anger seeping through my computer screen. He was angry at God for almost letting him die of cancer. And then he closed with this idea of how he had begun to finally find some peace in yoga and, and the Hindu meditations he had been learning and, and how he couldn't believe that Christians would think to believe that this other great culture of the world, this other great religion of the world would be excluded one day from heaven. And so I read this and, and like I said, this is not the first time I've gotten this kind of letter. Uh, I guess it must come with the being a pastor in the day and age of the internet. But I, I, I've seen these before, and so I knew he was hurting. I knew he was angry. But I was hoping to maybe still yet 
engage with him a little bit. And so I asked him specifically, I said, what, what made you so angry? What was the trigger? What was the thing that really set you off, that got you so offended here? Well, he, he wrote back. He, this had been bubbling in him for a while. And, and uh, he said, the, kind of the trigger point, he said, it was a, it was a number of years ago. I was in recovery. Uh, I, I, was, I, I was post-operative for my cancer, and I was at the hospital, and this chaplain came in, and the chaplain had seen, he said on my chart, that I'd marked that I'd been a Christian. So the chaplain came in, and so we started talking. And, and he said, pretty soon the chaplain started asking me some questions. And, and because of that, he said, this chaplain seemed to think I was going to hell because I wasn't ready to say that I believed that Jesus was the only way. So I don't know the exact interaction with that chaplain, but I, I asked him, I said, well, is perhaps the thing that this chaplain shared with you from this passage of the book of John, John 14, 6. I shared that passage with him that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except for through me. He's like, yeah, that's it. That is what he said. So in trying to hopefully redirect his anger a little bit, trying to find some common ground with him a little bit, because he was angry. I mean, he went out of his way to write me an angry letter, right? His anger had overflowed his pot. It bubbled and boiled over. So I'm hoping to find a little common ground and redirect him a little bit. I, I wrote back to him and I said, well, all right, I understand your problem with that. But what do you think about Jesus? How do you feel about Jesus? Who, who, who is Jesus to you? And he, he responded and he said, well, it was pretty clear that Jesus was a pretty amazing guy, right? He changed history. He said, in fact, he might be the most important figure in all of history. He said, at the very least, I'd put Jesus in the top two or three, Right? He didn't say who the other couple were, but he said Jesus in the top two or three, and that he's a very, very good man. So I continued chatting back and forth with him. Now that I understood he at least had some level of respect with Jesus, I knew that there was a little crack, right? There's a little light there, a little room for discussion. He had a little respect for Jesus. And so I, I shared with him, I, you know, I said, frankly, I get it. I understand your reluctance. I understand your frustration. I understand your even perhaps disagreement with that passage from John fourteen six. I said to him, frankly, that, that's a hard verse, that Jesus is the only way to heaven. I said, that's a really tough verse if you find yourself on the outside looking in. I get it. I understand. I agree even. That's a hard verse hard verse. But I said, you know what? That isn't the only place where Jesus said some stuff like that, though. I said, Jesus actually made a number of truth claims. And I suspected at this point he probably wasn't all that familiar with the Bible. And so I actually leaned into this point of tension with him. And I went on to explain a number of truths that Jesus said about himself, that how he had died for our sins, how he had raised from the dead, how his life had demonstrated that he was indeed the Son of God. And, and I could sense as we were chatting that his initial level of anger had started to subside. His, 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 he, he'd kind of, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, it's like verbal vomit, right? When somebody's angry at you, they got to blah, they got to get it out. Right? And once they kind of have spewed, they're a little more empty now, and they're easier to deal with. And that's kind of where I think we had found ourselves in this back and forth conversation we had. He had, he had released, and, and now we were having a little bit more of a rational conversation. And so I asked him, I, I said, you said yourself that Jesus was an amazing guy, Right? Yeah, he agreed. I said, you, you said he's probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, people who have ever walked the earth, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So with that being the case, I said to him, do you think a man who was perhaps the greatest man ever would walk around the earth telling lies about himself? Well, he didn't respond right away. And I said, 
Or do you think that rather instead of that, maybe he was just self-deluded, right? Maybe Jesus was a lunatic. He really believed that, but it wasn't true about him, right? What do you think of that? Maybe Jesus was crazy. And his response was, hmm. He just typed back after a moment of kind of screen silence. You know, I hadn't thought of it like that. And so I pressed a little bit further. And I suggested, hey, bud, and, and I steal these from C.S. Lewis, who probably stole them from somebody else, but I said, Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus I believe in, but I said, Jesus was either one of three things. He was either a liar, he was a lunatic, and if he wasn't either the liar or the lunatic, then he has to be Lord. Those are the only three options. Now, I wish I could tell you at this point in the story, right there on the computer keyboard, I got to lead him to Jesus. I didn't. Because not every story gets to go like we'd like to write it, right? That's not what happened. He said, you know, you give me something to think about. I'm going to need some time to digest. So, okay, fine. You know, I had kind of pressed, and I had actually pressed kind of hard, and you've got to be in tune with what the other person is feeling as you're sharing. And I could sense that if I pressed much further today, I might undo this whole conversation we had just had. So I said, all right, cool. Think about it. I said, hey, would you mind if I sent you a book? Oh, yeah, that'd be great, sure. So, all right, what's your address? He sends me his address. So I went out and got a copy of Lee Strobel's The Case for Faith. If you never read that, really, really good book about Lee Strobel's uh, was, has a background in law, was a writer for a newspaper, and how he went through the process as a lawyer and a journalist of examining the truth claims of Jesus and how that led to him. He was an atheist, led to him becoming a Christian. So I, I send that book off to my friend. Write a little note in the cover. Hey, you know, enjoy this book. If you've got any questions, you know where to find me. We'd love to talk to you some more. And over the next few months, he and I had a, a few more exchanges of backs and forths and, and whatnot to... Uh, talking about his experience with the book, talking about his experience as he was growing spiritually. Uh, he continued on. He had this girlfriend, like I said, who'd kind of introduced him to New Age spirituality and yoga and Hinduism. And, and he was trying to sift and filter and see where these came together and see where they didn't all jive. And, and, and he was working through it. He was struggling. But sadly... About a year later, I saw a f post on Facebook from a common friend of ours that the night before on his drive home from work, he had fallen asleep, rolled his car through the ditch, hit a tree, and had died. So I never got to lead him to faith. I don't know where he was in his faith journey. So I pray for him. I was praying for him before. I pray for him some today. I pray that someday I, I will see him in heaven, that maybe that book, or maybe somebody else had crossed his path and led him to the Lord. But what I do know is I tried, right? I tried. And why did I try? I didn't try because I was a pastor. I mean, yeah, I should try because I'm a pastor, but that's not why I tried. And I certainly wasn't his pastor. He lived on the other side of the country. He lived a long ways away. We were never really close friends, so I didn't, you know, like, have a lot of skin in the game personally. But I tried simply because I'm a believer. I shared with him simply because I love Jesus. Folks, men and women are truly lost without Jesus Christ. And according to God's word, Jesus is the only way to bridge that gap between humankind and God. And without him, people cannot know God. And people cannot have any sort of assurance of eternal life and salvation. And that's why despite this guy's initial anger, which could have scared me off, instead I chose to kind of lean into that anger a little bit. And I engaged with him. 
and tried to steer this man towards the light of the world. Because I knew I'd likely never get to meet him in person and see him in person. He lived a long ways away. But I knew I might be part of the story of how he one day came to faith. God had placed him in my path, and so it was my duty to be faithful. And it was my opportunity, and frankly, my blessing, to be able to interact with him about having faith in Jesus. In my many, many encounters with people who wouldn't consider themselves Christians, you know, I have found almost universally if you get past that little point of anger, if they have anger, almost universally, people who you might think, as a Christian you might think anyhow, people you might think aren't interested in hearing about Jesus are actually kind of interested. I've found that more often than not, people are open to us sharing our faith with them. In fact, I've found that people are actually tremendously hungry to hear about faith. Like a desert that's been waiting for the rain. You ever been to the desert before? I've been to some very arid climates. You walk through the desert sand, dirt dust blowing, maybe some cactus, occasionally some insects, maybe a lizard or a snake, but there's not much. But if you've ever been in the desert after it rains, it comes so alive, so quickly, you would not believe it. Plants grow out of nowhere. Animals arrive from who knows where. And all it took was just a little bit of rain. And I've found that people's souls are kind of like that. They're dry. They're hard. They've been baked in the sun. And you sprinkle a little living water on them, and they bloom. Life is restored. It's beautiful. The people of the world are looking for God. There is a deep spiritual hunger. And further, when we approach them in the power of the Holy Spirit, the majority are willing to, at the very least, listen. I've been doing some studying as I've, both before I moved here, but as I've lived here. Aiken County, there is a deep spiritual hunger here. There's a lot of people a long ways away from God. We see them every day. And that's not a criticism of them. I was there. But there's a lot of people hurting. There is a huge spiritual harvest just outside these doors in the fields all around us. But the problem is, we as Christians, we're afraid to go out and be part of the harvest. We're afraid to go out and share. We as Christians, in fact, even erect barriers that aren't even there to rationalize to ourselves for why we don't share our faith. We falsely tell ourselves that other people, nah, they wouldn't be interested. Right? I've told myself that. But here's the thing I've found. People want to hear your story. They legitimately want to hear your story. And as you tell your story, people cannot deny how God has worked in your life. Even if they don't believe in your God, they can't deny it. It's your story. How many of you know somebody here in Aiken County who needs a little bit of hope? How many of you know somebody in Aiken County who would really benefit from a little bit of grace? How many of you know somebody in Aiken County who's struggling with sin, struggling with addiction? I suspect every one of us 
can say yes to all three of those. And if you could provide the source to the solution of that, don't you think they could possibly want to listen? Share your story. We must relearn to assume that our family members, our classmates, our neighbors, our co-workers, or that person maybe you've just met for the first time, we have to relearn to assume that they want to hear our story. Because far too often, we think, ah, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear about Jesus. They don't want to hear it, my story. Wrong. They do. Always presuppose the positive. The person might have just gone through a set of circumstances that their heart is broken and it's fertile soil and you have the word that they need. And God has placed you in their life at that time, at that place, because you carry the message they need to hear. God may have been leading that person to you for days, weeks, months, years because of his or her need for the truth. While we're at it, let me pull down one other barrier. We do erect barriers as Christians falsely so that we don't have to share our faith. Because, well, I'm not an evangelist, right? One of the biggest fears people have in sharing their faith and again, I've had this fear, and I still have this fear sometimes, is what if I don't have the right words? What if I say something wrong? What if I sound stupid? Yeah, I've sounded stupid before. And so we say that to ourselves. We erect a barrier because we're afraid, right? I don't want to screw this up. I don't want to mess this up. I want, I want the right words. I want to say the right thing. But I tell you what. Those are lies we tell ourselves. Those are lies from Satan. Just tell your story. Speak the truth in love and tell your story. If you stutter, if you stumble, if you mess things up, if you say something wrong, that's okay. That happens. God can still use that. God is still sovereign. God is still in control. God, through the Holy Spirit, is the ultimate one working in that situation and not you. So don't worry whether or not you have the exact right words. Don't worry if you don't have all the right answers. It's okay to say, well, I don't know. Let me get back to you on that. That happens to me as a pastor. Somebody will ask me a question, I'll say, well, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you. Don't be afraid. But rather, be faithful. If you're worried about saying something wrong when you go to share Jesus, just tell your own personal story. It's easy to tell our own story, right? The single subject we like to talk about the very most, even more than your grandkids, I bet. Many of you really like to talk about your grandkids. But the thing that we are hardwired to talk about is us. Spend some time with a young child. I've got a seven-year-old in my house. He'll tell you all about himself. Right? We are experts at telling you about me. Tell your story. But do it in a way that points to Jesus. Tell your story, which includes God's story. We as, as Christians have the greatest story, the greatest gift ever given to mankind. The greatest news ever announced. Christ is risen. We serve a living Savior. A God who lives. Who lives within us. A God with a resurrection power. And a God who has assured us of eternal life. A God who died on the cross in our place for our sins and then rose from the dead and we have a direct fellowship with that God through Jesus Christ. And all of this fellowship, this peace, this gift of eternal life is available to anyone. Right? Yes. It is. Yes, I do believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven.
But I believe that that gift is available to everyone. And so why are we so hesitant to share this good news? Because it is good news. Why is it so, we're, we're so quick, we're, we're, none of us, I mean, most of us anyhow, probably aren't afraid to talk about what you believe about politics, right? You might not stand up in a room like I am today talking about politics, but if I asked you, oh yeah, I think this guy, or I think that guy, or I think that girl, or that, so on and so forth, right? You'd have no problems articulating that for me today. Or maybe you could tell me why you think this football team is better than that football team, right? I could tell you lots of reasons why the Vikings are better than the Packers, other than Super Bowl rings. You know, they kind of got us there. My brother's a Packer fan. I'm a Viking fan. I don't know what happened to my family. But we can talk about that stuff. You could tell me all about your grandkids, right? You could tell me about what plays they were in, how their sports teams are doing, what grades they got. If you got young grandkids that you're learning to walk, you tell me about the first words that they said. You tell me all about tricks you've taught your dog. Right? Roll over, play dead. I'm really good at teaching dogs how to beg for food. Right? I'm good at that one. We can talk about all those things. You can tell me about the bills that you paid this last week. You can tell me about all that stuff, right? But then all of a sudden we clam up. We tense up. We get afraid when it comes to discussing the best story ever told. The good news of the gospel. If our, our faith in Christ really means as much to us as it should, then it only follows that our faith should be the number one message on our lips. Because people want to hear good news. The world is full of bad news. Turn on your television. It's a train wreck of bad news. Horrible, horrible things happening all over the world, all the time, right there on your television, 24 hours a day if you want it. I don't watch the news, folks. I refuse to watch television news because it is horrible. It's depressing. I, know, I already know the world is broken. I don't need more evidence. I won't let my son be in the room if TV's on and there's news on. And I, like I said, I, re- I almost don't watch news at all. But if he walks in the room, I switch the station because almost inevitably something inappropriate is going to be on the news. Something I don't want in the life of my seven-year-old child. The world is filled with bad news. And we have the good news, folks. We have the greatest news, folks. And people want to hear good news. Just as the desert wants the rain. And when you present it in the power of the Holy Spirit with love, you usually will see a positive response. Now you may not get to lead him to faith, just like I didn't get to lead that guy to faith before. The Bible tells us We are to labor. We might not be the one who gets to harvest. And we have to be okay with that. But we can be part of that person's story. The love of Jesus Christ for all of us and our love for him compels us to share him with others. If you don't feel the need of this, if you don't feel the need to share your faith, I have to ask you then, what is it you do believe? Because remember, Jesus says this, John 14, 21. The one who obeys me is the one who loves me. The one who obeys me is the one who loves me. What was his command? Go share the good news everywhere, to everyone, right? If Jesus is measuring our love for him, by how we follow his commands. We therefore must, must be a people about sharing the good news. And as we obey, Jesus promises he will reveal himself 
to us and through us. He says this, he says, and he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. So what are we supposed to obey? When it comes to witnessing, when it comes to sharing our faith, we are to go and make disciples of all nations. Go and share Jesus with everyone, everywhere, fulfilling the Great Commission. We'll wrap up with this last set of ideas here and then we'll say some prayers and get out of here. Related to our sharing of faith, we are called as Christians to be obedient to God's word daily. As God gives us guidance and as God brings us into contact with people from all walks of life. I suspect you, like me, have had this feeling where God gives you that little prompting, where God kind of tugs at your heartstrings and says, hey, dummy, listen, this person's ready, right? Maybe God doesn't call you dummy, but he usually has to call me dummy to get my attention. He says, hey, buddy, I'm talking to you now. You feel that spiritual tap on the shoulder. God says, love this person, serve this person, tell this person about me. You ever brush that off? I have. God, not right now. I'm busy. God, I got to get to work. God, I don't know the words. God, I don't want to be embarrassed. God, he's my boss. We quickly try to shoo that away sometimes, don't we? We're tempted to neglect God's whispering in our ear. But Jesus promises us in Matthew 4.19. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. If you are following him, you're going to go fishing, whether you like it or not. We live in one of the greatest regions in probably all of the world for fishing, right? There are lakes everywhere up here. There's a lake in my backyard at the moment. I didn't buy lakefront property, folks. There's lakes everywhere. There's fish everywhere. I have seen northerns that have scared me from ever swimming in a lake again, pulled out of regional lakes. You pull a 40-inch northern out with a mouth this big, he sees my toes, what's going to happen? Right? Right? Most all of us have fished before, right? Could you imagine planning a big fishing trip, right? We're going to go fishing this weekend. We pack the boat. We make some sandwiches. We fill the cooler. We buy the bait. We gas up the boat. We gas up the truck. We drive out to the lake. We back the truck down the ramp. We get the boat out. We go out to that spot where, you know, we've, we've marked on our fish finder exactly where we found that lunker last year, and we're going back there again. So we get there. Whoo, I'm excited. And we sit there. And we sit there. The bait swims around in the bait tank. The rods rattle on the side of the boat, but we never bother to bait the hook. We never bother to throw a line in. We just sit there. Sun's shining. It's a nice day. It's not a bad day to be sitting in a boat, but... It's not why we're here. And we sit there. And we just keep sitting there. Maybe we didn't catch any fish because we're at the wrong spot. So we troll over to another spot, right? So we sit in a new spot. But we leave the bait in the tank and the rods just sitting there. It must be this lake. Go drive our boat back onto the trailer, drive off, go to the next lake, right? Get out in that next lake and 
get in there. We sit there. We go home. Our friends, our neighbors, our wife, our kids, our husbands says, what'd you catch? We didn't catch anything. Fishing was terrible. What were you fishing with? Oh, no, we didn't put any lines in the water, right? Does that make sense to anybody else? Would you do that? We do that, folks. Maybe not for fish, but as fishers of men. So often we don't put the line in the water. We have what the fish wants. We've got the most delicious bait ever. All we've got to do is get it out there. Now the first time you cast, you might not catch something, right? The story of fishing is you've got to keep fishing. And the story of fishing is once you catch one, keep fishing, right? So we've got to cast. If something doesn't bite, well, let's try a different bait. Let's try a spinner. Let's try mush, m- marshmallows. Let's try whatever they got. We'll try a frog. We'll try, I mean, we'll try anything if it's going to catch a fish. I've seen guys change lures 10 times in 20 minutes because they want to catch a fish. And if they don't catch a fish there, they'll move somewhere else and try it again. And if that doesn't work, yeah, they'll get the boat out of that lake, drive somewhere else and try in a new spot. All for a stupid fish. If we'll do that for a fish, how much more? How much more should we do for someone's eternal soul. We're called to be fishers of men, folk. We've got to get our lines. We've got to get our nets. We've got to get them in the water. Be intentional about it. Because God has equipped us. I don't care if you're not an evangelist. I'm not an evangelist. I'm with you on that. But God goes with you. Jesus says he will make us fishers of men. It's not our job to get them on the line. It's our job to put the line out there. So I'll close with this thought. Before you go home today, and I'm going to pray in a minute so you can give this some thought and prayer. Before you go home today, I challenge each and every one of you, think of five people. Just five. Not six, not four, but five. Five people that you will commit to praying for. Pray for them every day. Five people. If you get a chance to share faith with them, take them off the list, add somebody back on. Just five people. Five people you will pray, pray, pray this week that you will get an opportunity to share faith with them. And then invite them to come and join us here at Glory Baptist Church. Just five people. I'm going to be praying that God convicts you this week. And I'm going to be praying that God brings those people into your life and makes you a little bit uncomfortable so that you can get a line in the water. Always be ready to share your faith. It could be very well that God has led that person to you at that place in time because you know the good news. And that person needs to hear it. Let's pray.